It's May 18th, and the International Energy Agency released its uh, Pathways to Net Zero by 2050 report, which is causing quite a stir uh, internationally. So we're going to talk to Kingsmail Bond about what happens uh, if this pathway is achieved by global governments. Where does it create risk? So welcome to the interview, Kingsmail. Hi, Malcolm. Nice to see you again. Likewise. Uh, so you put out an interesting uh, early uh, response to the report, and it was all about where is, you know, where is risk created? Fossil fuels, financial sector, and other places. Um, so give me kind of the overview of your argument, if you will, please. So, so the overview of the argument is that for many years, the IEA and the fossil fuel sector has been telling us that um, we're going to have to carry on with business as usual because there's no alternative and um, demand for fossil fuels regrettably is going to continue to rise because we can't do without it and that was the narrative uh, uh, as I say of the incumbency and the IEA for many many years so that's why this um, this new report that came out this morning was so important because the IEA basically said actually no um, you don't have to carry on with business as usual you can achieve um, a very significant reduction in fossil fuel demand, you can achieve one and a half degrees, and this is how you do it. Um, and what that does, it, it, it well, and, and in their uh, analysis how to do it, basically it, it, it meant or implied that you would have peak um, coal demand in, in 2013, as they've already said, peak oil demand in 2019, peak fossil fuel demand in 2019, and, and a gas peak in the early 2020s. Um, but then as soon as those peaks are achieved, you then get um, a, a decline turning into a quite rapid decline, a rout, as it were. Um, that's that's the kind of narrative that they have framed, and that creates very significant risks. Well, let's talk before we get into the specific risks. Um, COP twenty six is uh, coming up this fall, and it's pretty clear that this uh, report was released ahead of that to feed into that process and to perhaps spur. Uh, governments to uh, greater commitments uh, that are consistent with that pathway. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's exactly it. So when the IEA, of course, a famously political organization, they've seen the writing on the wall, they've seen the changes which politicians are now uh, are demanding. I mean, the last change in the last 12 months have been spectacular. We've gone from almost, almost nobody to now 70% of global economies is saying they want to get to net zero. Um, and, and of course, you've also had, and we shouldn't forget about this, you had this spectacular collapse, collapse in the costs of renewable energy technologies, you know, solar, wind and hydrogen and, and batteries, and it just made all of this stuff achievable. So um, the IEA has taken all this stuff and created a framework to be presented to policymakers so that policymakers now um, can start to put it into effect. Right. OK, so let's talk about some of the risks that doing that would create. Let's start with the fossil fuel sector. What's your take on risk there? Well, the thing about the fossil fuel sector, as with any incumbent, is they're enormous. And, and furthermore, they've been extremely resistant to the notion of any change. So they're not just enormous, but they're tooled up for growth. And they, they, the way their initial reaction to, to all of this, this stuff has been basically greenwashing, you know, like we're going to plant some trees, um, but basically carry on doing what we do because that's what we do. Um, and, and this report is basically saying, well, actually, that's not going to work because demand is going to fall. There's going to be overcapacity and you have to start closing it down. And the, the, the problem for the incumbents under those circumstances is that the, these, um, these kind of tactical, tactical solutions they've come up with just aren't going to wash. You need a very big strategic shift. And um, that's, that, that means they're going to have to change very radically. Uh, let's talk about financial risk. So. Uh, under the scenario outlined by the IEA, um, uh, banks, insurance companies, uh, Wall Street, uh, Bay Street, uh, Fleet Street uh, are all in big in big trouble. Uh, and you're a financial analyst, so what's your take on that? Well, the, the 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 problem is you've got huge. If you've got an oil system which is tooled up for for example for 100 million barrels of oil a day of demand, growing to to let's say 105 or 110. Um, and, and, and they've now got a disruptive, disruptive competitor coming in, which both means that um, demand's gonna fall and, and there's real price competition. It, it, it just means that they, they are gonna have left with huge amounts of stranded assets because you just don't need this stuff anymore. And that's exactly what the IEA says in their piece. They're like, look, you know, you're not gonna need these refineries. You don't need any new 
um, oil and gas exploration. So all the companies which are doing oil and gas exploration are not necessary anymore. You're not going to need a massive LNG industry. I mean, their graph for the future of LNG demand in this scenario is absolutely chilling. And here we are spending hundreds of billions of dollars building out a redundant industry. What are we thinking? Um, so the point is that all of the companies which are doing that, all of the infrastructure which is being built for the expansion is, is, is stranded immediately um, under, a, under, un, under this uh, type of IEA scenario. Uh, a few years ago, I think it was Spencer Dale, uh, the chief economist for BP, I think he wrote in their 2018 annual report of about a scenario where uh, if it looked like uh, peak demand had oil demand had been reached and then it, there was going to be a fairly uh, steep decline in consumption, that the low cost producers like Saudi Arabia would immediately flood the market and fight for market share uh, of a declining resource to max in order to maximize their their revenue, and I know that that scenario has been dismissed uh, roundly in in the oil and gas uh, uh, sector, and yet here we see if the IEA you know scenario comes true this 2050 uh, net zero by 2050 model. Uh, that's what's your what do you think that that the Spencer uh, Dale's scenario uh, analysis might come true. Well, I mean, it's a risk, right? You know, it's very hard to maintain, a car to maintain a cartel and high prices in an environment of falling demand and 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 structural change. I mean, it absolutely stands to reason. Um, so yeah, it, it 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 will be it will be considerably harder for uh, uh, OPEC to maintain price to price discipline in in an environment of, of falling demand. Now, there's an area of risk here that uh, you didn't address in your email, but I, I think we should bring it up. And that is the risk of global electricity systems to adapt to uh, rapid electrification of economies. And I know uh, from my work that I've done in uh, the North America, the Canadian electricity system is still very much 20th century industrial model and is uh, would uh, rapid change would be very difficult for it. The US is further ahead down that road in terms of integrating renewables and, and batteries and so on, but still a lot of work needs to be done. So in your opinion, uh, how much of a risk is it that our electricity systems can't keep up with our uh, greater uh, emphasis on electrification? Um, so my answer may surprise you, Markham. The answer is there is no risk whatsoever. and. The reason why is because we're not stupid, right? We can see the future and we will plan for it accordingly. Well, not all of us are stupid, I should say. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we can see the future, we can plan accordingly. And, and, and in, in defense of my argument, and, and rather than your listeners might think I'm terribly glib, you know, go back to 1900, right? Like in 1900, we had no electricity systems anywhere. And, you know, if you were to have said to a, an electricity analyst in 1900, well, you know, within a century, we're going to have be delivering um, uh, 20,000 terawatt hours of electricity across the world um, to um, uh, 7,000 million people, they would have laughed in your face. And it's the same situation now. Of course, it's hard. Of course, we need to change systems. Of course, we need to expand grids and, um, and, and, and amend stuff. But that's, you know, that's what we do, right? Oh, okay, fair enough. Well, let's talk about part of that system, which is renewables. And one of the points you made in your email is that the IEA has consistently underestimated the potential for wind, solar, and batteries, and even continues to do so in this scenario. So, I mean, Alki Huckstrop, of course, has famously been pointing out the, the, the bias of the IEA modeling, the failure of the IEA to, to realize um, the speed of the growth of, of solar um, and, and wind um, for many, many years. And there's a structural bias because it's always, they're always getting it wrong on the low side, not the high side. Um, so if you look at the same, uh, that same question with regard to the deployment of solar, for example, um, you'll see they've upped their game finally in for, um, for this decade, um, the 2020s, they've got 22% annual growth of, of, of capacity um, for solar, which is sort of more or less what I would expect, actually possibly even a little bit high. But the point to me is that you know, solar is still growing at 20-25%, so 22% a year for this decade is not unreasonable. However, the problem then is they then reduce that growth rate to 8% in the following decade and 3% in the following decade. And, and, you know, we just make the observation, why would that happen? Why would growth suddenly fall off a cliff, particularly 
in an environment where the costs are falling very, very rapidly. And this sort of brings me then to the second problem in the IEA analysis is that um, they are assuming that costs stop falling or, or, or that costs, to be precise, shift from falling at 18% a year, um, which they have done for the last decade or so, to, to 5% a year this decade and then 2% a year the decade after. I'm like, well, you might be right, but you know, that's actually a really important um, uh, call that you're making and please explain it. And they don't, of course, anywhere. And I think the answer is conservatism. You know, the answer is, well, you know, we've got to be conservative. Well, but I'm a financial market analyst. I mean, you don't want to be conservative, you want to be right. And it's just not right. You know, read the research that's done by people like Doyne Farmer. These learning curves are incredibly sticky and it's much more likely that costs will continue to fall quite rapidly. Um, and, and, and therefore, actually, that has two very significant consequences. Sorry, Malcolm, I'm rabbiting on a bit, but it means, first of all, the transition can be cheaper than people think, and secondly, much easier. Well, here's the third uh, thing that it could be, and this is uh, uh, Tony Siva had recently made this a few months ago in a, in a study, and he said that once the marginal cost of electricity comes down to close to zero, so in this case, maybe one or two cents a, a kilowatt hour, which we're not far away from now, uh, mm -hmm. All sorts of things happen. Literally, economies get transformed because cheap, abundant, clean energy calls into uh, calls into being, into existence, all sorts of industries and jobs that we had never thought about before. Some, suddenly, the impossible becomes possible, and we have enormous growth in things like hydrogen that suddenly are economic. And what's your take on that? Well, I mean, you know, the great Toby Cena, Tony Sieber is, is right again. Um, it's true. I mean, you know, when you get, well, we are getting now 10 to $20, high, sorry, uh, solar. And if you think of hydrogen basically as expensive solar, um, and, and, and let's say this rule of thumb might be, it's going to be twice the price of solar. So, you know, you're talking, if it's solar's 10, then, you know, think of hydrogen as 10 times two. It's still very cheap, right? Um, uh, so, so, so I guess I totally buy that. And I think this is the reason why it's quite amusing that people think they can project in detail how the world energy system will look in, in, in 20 years time, nobody knows actually. I mean, the only thing we can say is likely is that uh, when costs continue to fall as rapidly as they've been falling and, 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 and assuming they do continue to fall, and um, that then opens up precisely as Steve has been saying, you know, new opportunities. And, you know, it means kind of very, very detailed attempts to figure out exactly the balance between hydrogen and biomass and CCS electrification is somewhat redundant. I mean, the answer is going to be some variant of, 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 of electricity and, and hydrogen from that electricity. And, and, you know, you don't need to know today exactly how it, how it plays out. Well, speaking of playing out, I guess we'll know more how this plays out uh, this fall at COP26 when governments sort of signal their intent uh, and their take on uh, on this report. But thank you very much for your insights, Kingsmill. Always appreciate it. Thanks, Malcolm.